Does anybody know what happened on October 23rd, 2001? And I actually want people to guess if you, if you would so humor me. October 23rd, 2001, very, very famous day in our history. I thought that would happen. <laughs> Steve Jobs changed my life. Steve Jobs unveils the first iPod. All right, let's do it again. October 18th, 2003. October 23rd, 2003. You all have personal computers in your pockets. You could at least be cheating and Googling. <laughs> but it's an honest crowd, apparently. Mark Zuckerberg found FaceMatch, the predecessor for Facebook. Big, big day. How about this, the infamous, more infamous day of September 15th, 2008. Anybody take a shot at that? What was that? Oh. The poster children for the, uh, the rough times. Lehman Brothers closed their doors, ushering the largest bankruptcy in U.S. history. And how about a date that nobody in this room knows, I guarantee you, October 15th, 2008. In the bowels of the depression, I founded 616 Laws, a real estate development company. I, uh, let's start with a quote. People without the knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. That's Marcus Garvey. I uh, thought I'd go back to my history and my roots to help better frame up um, who I am and what I'm all about. And once you find out what I do for a living, my, uh, my origins won't be too much of a mystery, hopefully. Uh, Lake Edessa is where I was born and raised, uh, the sprawling megalopolis of 2,000 people. Uh, if you draw, draw a line between Lansing and Grand Rapids, it's 30 miles each way. Um, but when I, when I was born, I hit the lottery. I uh, was born um, with two parents that were amazing, both public school teachers. and just kind of taught me what community was all about. Um, they were great people. Uh, Lake Edessa is the type of community where if you did something wrong, Another mom would call your mom, and we all kind of took care of each other. So there was pros and cons, and we learned that you know there was consequences for bad things. So there's pros and cons of community, which we'll, we'll kind of talk about. Um, I was the stereotypical uh, Friday Night Lights quarterback, um, and the whole barber shops thing on Saturday mornings was actually true. They did talk about the touchdowns, and in my case, most likely the interceptions. Did that a lot. I did this as a note because you're all wondering why am I talking about my child and like this. Uh, education consists mainly of what we have on my Mark Twain. Those Friday night lights got me into a bigger venue, um, the College of William and Mary. I was able to play there, um, immerse myself in the history of, of colonial Williamsburg. William and Mary is the oldest college in our country. Uh, Harvard is the oldest university. William and Mary the oldest college. Um, I learned. Um, quickly about about community there as well. I, I bonded quickly with my with my teammates. Um, great band of brothers. I found myself in a different part of the the country, different culture. Felt like a different world. Um, so I bonded quickly with a group of guys. Had too many concussions going into my spring ball sophomore year and had to stop. At the time, that was my identity, which sounds funny to say out loud today. Um, I I. Uh, for the first time in my life, I didn't, I didn't know who I was or what I was doing. Um, so I isolated myself, I pulled myself away from people. So for the first time in my life, I was alone. Um, and so luckily, some boosters of the uh, football team took me under their wing. They were big real estate developers, um, big multifamily guys. They owned 5,000 units across the country, um, 90 unit plus communities, awesome guys. Um, they. Uh, they, they brought me in at property management um, at, the, at the lowest level. I got to learn the business from the, the bottom up. And, and I remember one I remember one, um, one day, my first day, uh, the, my boss came to me and said, go, go uh, do an informal survey of three communities, three of their, their main communities in, in Williamsburg. And so I went, um, got in the truck, and went to my first um, apartment complex. And I was greeted by Doris. Doris was a lovely Southern Belle, and Doris invited me in, gave me some iced tea, and she said, what do you need? So I, I said, how do you like your apartment complex? And she said, I don't live in an apartment complex. I said, okay, where do you live? She said, I live at my home right here, you're in it. I said, okay, how do you like your home? 
She said, you know, they treat me great. They, uh, they, the neighbors are incredible. I love living here. And I said, well, what else do you like? She said, well, I like Hot Dog Fridays. I said, well, what's Hot Dog Fridays? She said, every Friday the management comes and brings hot dogs, and all the neighbors come together, and, and we talk about issues around, and we talk about solutions, and we talk about uh, neighbors and taking care of your neighbor, and, and we get to know each other. So I, uh, I left there, and then I went to the next one, and, and I said, I said basically the same, the same thing, heard the same things, three different places I did this. I went back to work um, at the end of the day, and my boss asked me, well, what did you learn? I said, well, the first thing I learned was, was you know, they, they, their vernacular was different. I said apartment complexes, they kept correcting me. They'd say home or, or community or neighbors. I said the second thing is they really like hot dogs. So he laughed and he thought, he said, he said, Derek, it's not the hot dogs. He said, four years ago, we were struggling with tent retention, uh, maintenance, deferred maintenance. Um, and just, just huge management issues, and we started infusing a, a community style of, of management. And he said all of a sudden our tenant retention was, was better, uh, turnover was better, um, evictions were down, maintenance was, was better. And so they, they continued to do that. So I took my hot dog uh, education back up to Michigan, and I, and I moved to Grand Rapids. Growing up um, between Grand Rapids and Lansing, you know, we would go to a uh, movie, and we'd either go to Lansing or Grand Rapids, and even at a young age, um, I felt a better energy uh, when we went to Grand Rapids, and, and I, I can't really articulate even today why that is, but I ended up uh, going to Grand Rapids. Uh, I bought my first house, was petrified, my dad taught me through it at a young age, and it was pretty easy, so I decided to buy one property per week for as long as I could. I went 37 weeks, I had 150 residents all of a sudden, I was making good money, um, but something was missing. I, I didn't have that community, my properties were all spread out, I had complexes everywhere, and, and I didn't have any sort of uh, cohesion, no critical mass, no, no real means to make a difference. So I thought I'd try my hot dog thing. So I advertised, I put flyers out, I advertised for weeks and weeks, and, and went to an apartment complex brought hot dogs, brought some stuff to drink, and four tenants showed up, and they all told me how much they hated my apartment complex. <laughs> so, so I learned a big lesson to that day. It's if, if the only the building owner is trying to instigate community, it doesn't work. You need, you need both sides. You need ownership, and you need tenants participating. So I learned a quote during that time, community is the mental and spiritual condition of knowing that the place is shared, and that the people who share the place define and limit the possibilities of each other's lives. Wendell Berry. While I was on my buying bender, I ended up in um, an urban sprawl, uh, suburban setting. Five bedrooms, no kids. I was uh, living the dream. Um, I needed a shovel one day, I remember, and I needed a shovel for the one hole I was going to dig um, that whole year, probably. So I went to Ace Hardware, and I drove by probably 60 houses. 40 shovels. I didn't know any of my neighbors, and so I went and bought my shovel, dug my one hole, and hung in my garage. Went inside, and for the second time, I was isolated again. I was away from people, and 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 it sucked. So I, I moved downtown. I sold my house, luckily somehow. Um, moved downtown to a large, kind of fringe, urban, um, new apartment complex. Couldn't find anything in the urban core. In, in the urban core, really, no market rate apartments, and that kind of surprised me. Um, but I didn't think much of it. Uh, I started uh, trying to get to know my neighbors in this 118 unit complex and I couldn't, I couldn't connect with anybody. So I thought it was start, I thought I was the problem, which was probably part of it. Um, I, I started something, um, I tried my hot dog thing again, and I started Movie Mondays, which, which I thought was gonna be really cool, a way to connect everybody in the building and I was gonna be that guy which I ended up being that guy. Um, there, was a, there was a movie room that I thought I could, I could bring everybody in on Mondays and, and we could all come together and watch a movie together and, and eat and drink and have fun. And two people showed up the first week and they didn't like it, so they didn't come back. And then two more came the next and started to feel like a loser. Um, so I started advertising through the property manager 
uh, Monica Clark, who works for us today in a different role and a much happier role. Um, but she was she was working for a large property management company, and she, her hands were tied. So I couldn't I couldn't get help from the ownership. Um, so I, I learned that day only residents instigate community. That doesn't work either. So from there, um, I started thinking if I could combine you know some of my my real estate experience with with some of my passion to connect people. Um, maybe we could figure something out. So I started asking the question, why? Um, there's a great quote that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Uh, inspired leadership comes from, from mission-minded people. And so I had something, I knew I had something, but I didn't know what I had. So it was 08 and real estate was great. So I thought I'd start, start buying stuff. Um, I started studying uh, the brain actually when I went through my concussion thing in college, our, our team doctor was um, was an amazing man, and he taught me about the biology of the brain. There's two big parts: the neocortex and the limbic system, the limbic brain. Um, your neocortex is, can can discern language and is your rational thoughts. Your limbic brain is, is something that can't articulate words. Um, it's your gut feel. So when you say, "I, I, I just feel," it just feels right. That's your limbic system. That's that's your gut level. So I started studying that, and I started saying things that people were attracted to. So um, somehow I hired Monica Clark from that old apartment complex. I'm not sure how I paid her, but I did. Um, and she came in, and she helped me create 616 Lots. And we had this, this grandiose idea to create a downtown community because we thought people might want to live downtown. Um, we also had Marjorie, um, who was a freelance copywriter. She came into our world and she was able to dig into my limbic brain and, and pull out words and we were able to put a website together and, and, and it started to make more sense as we were able to start articulating what we were feeling in our guts. Um, she has a funny quote, 616 has been both the most difficult and the most rewarding clients I've ever had the pleasure of working with when you have such an amazing complex vision to articulate the difficulty of the project becomes a joy. Um, she must have omitted the swear words. <laughs> Um, so we started studying more and more about what we were feeling. Uh, we started articulating it better. We started we started having units available. We got flooded. We had to shut down marketing. Uh, we started a waiting list. Um, it was this generation Y. It was this young people who were born into this isolation. They were born into um, suburban settings. I was lucky enough to grow up in a in a rural community where I, I grew up in the woods. Um, didn't have video games had a tribe of little neighborhood kids that got in all sorts of trouble. Um, and, and so I was dealing with this different generation that I was a part of, but not really. The people that know me best say I'm the oldest young guy they've ever met, which I don't know if that's a compliment um, or not. I, I started to make sense of, of this generation, where they came from. They, they weren't out in the woods playing there. They grew up with video games. And they, they grew up with iPods where you could put earbuds in and you didn't need people, you could text, and we started losing that, that connectedness, that, that feeling in this generation. And so um, I'm old school, I love face-to-face, -face. I love um, talking on the phone, and I'm a bad texter. So I, I, I started really digging into this more and more, and people were, were liking it. Um, I started learning more about the generation, and Simon Sinek has something called a split, where, where something's founded on a on a really inspired um, mission and belief system, and, and such as such as where you know our, our urban sprawl kind of went, it was going kind of a good mission to have a better life, and then the why kind of drifted away, and you had this split, and that's where I think I found our generation, and I started realizing that that it was really interesting this this generation that was born into this like isolation um, started to create this virtual community, this virtual connectedness. Um, it was amazing to me as I started thinking about it through these lenses that, that a generation that, um, that didn't know how to shake hands almost were, were yearning for connectedness and they were yearning for uh, this Facebook, this all this stuff. So we started leveraging it. We started really, really articulating what, what we thought they wanted and we think they want community. Um, we, we think they want a place to, to live closer together, um, to have a platform to come together. 
And so we started, it started becoming more clear and we started having more answers and we started thinking about the urban center and what that all has always been about, art and community, entrepreneurship and innovation, social change, it all happens in urban centers. So it all started to make more sense and then we started thinking about where we were at, at a, at a macro level. We, we had this huge macro push back into the urban center and that's where we're at um, almost today. We have to learn to live together again. Uh, so we started thinking about instead of just developing buildings and filling them, we, we, had to, we had to infuse this thing with community. We had to start understanding what this generation wanted um, and, and how, to, how, how, do we, how do we bring these people together. Um, so we started investing in it. We just hired Marjorie. She is, she is going to be a nurturer of our community. Uh, we, we started buying a building and we, we pre-leased it during construction. Uh, we thought, again, people wanted to live downtown, and so we redeveloped the Flanagan's building with market rate apartments. And we, we leased them all before construction was done. We were, we were walking tenants through, you know, over drywall, over very, very dangerous studs, probably. Hope our insurance agent's not here. That would be bad. Um, we we pre-leased it, and, and we, we pre-leased it on this promise of community that when you were a part of this building, you were a part of a bigger thing. You were part of 616 Lofts. And if you lived here, then you were you were in the same community with another building and another building, and you could share amenities, and it was a big, happy family. We filled it all, and, and while we were high-fiving, and, and our banks were happy, and everybody was happy, uh, we started getting phone calls from our tenants, uh, one by one by one, until they all called and said, you're not following through. Uh, where is this community thing you guys promised? Um, it's not happening. So we realized that, that creating buildings isn't that hard. Um, it's been happening since ancient Rome. It's how do, you, how do you fill it and create a viable community, and that's where we're at today. Um, we've done some things good, we've, we've failed at some things, um, but we're on a mission to figure out how to get this world in tighter spaces, uh, because I, I, I can't imagine the world's gonna go a different way. Um, that's our mission. Uh, so we, we started uh, little things like we created a position, the tenant liaison, where she lives above Flanagan's. She gives us raw feedback uh, from what's really going on with our tenants and, and we kind of see from a, from a different level what that actually means. Uh, she's moving above Grand Rapids Green Company right now. So uh, very, very valuable. We started doing tenant mixers with, with different downtown businesses. Uh, that would come into our office and we could bring all our tenants in and they would learn about the business and then they would bring stuff and, and we would have a couple of drinks and, and start connecting that way. Uh, 616 swag, so we could all start looking the same. Not really. Um, so that, that's kind of where we're at today. We, um, we believe we're into something. Uh, I, think, I think we gotta figure this out, um, but we're not there yet. We keep buying buildings and fill them, but we gotta figure out how to how to bring it all together. Um, so that's that's the gist of what I want to say today. Um, I, I can open it up for questions if you have any. If you don't, it'll be embarrassing for me. So <laughs> you can give me something, a, a pity question. I have a couple of seeds out there, don't I? Yeah. This is a pity question, and forgive me because if you discuss this in your presentation, I missed it. I am from Grand Rapids, and I'm curious about um, what you anticipate happening in terms of locating grocery and um, you know the knickknacky or the Walgreens yeah. type things in downtown or if the urban market might be addressing some of those needs. Yeah, I think it will be addressing some of those needs. Um, that is everybody's question. That's my question. I love, I love the thought of having a grocery store. Uh, it, it's all numbers and I'm, I'm the first time that a retail guy. Um, I'm an I'm a upper floor residential guy. We just happen to inherit really good retail space, and so it's easy to fill. Um, it, it all comes down to numbers and people living in dense areas, so that's our mission, is to create critical mass in the urban core. Uh, and I think we're, we're getting closer and closer because there's fewer and fewer opportunities of infill, infill which is what we do. Um, so I think a grocery store is inevitable. Um, I hope sooner than later, because our tenants right now, um, we're kind of doing the band-aid approach 
where we have a door-to-door -door organics company that actually brings fresh produce every week to our office and our tenants sign up and, and that's our that's our short-term solution for our community. Um, but I agree with you, we need it. Um, probably Sam Cummins could answer that better. He's, he's a better retail guy. Um, but I do think it's inevitable. I really do. From what you've learned from your experience, what do you think is relevant more so in the Grand Rapids community versus what do you think can be leveraged to other similar type areas? Other similar type communities? Yeah. Different cities? Yeah. Um, well, good question. I, I, I'm so extremely biased with the 616 Loft brand, but we created it to be replicatable in different markets. So we're looking at opportunities in Kalamazoo and Battle Creek, and that will be 269 Loft, Lansing 517 Loft. I think, I, I'm a firm believer in urban suction. When you create space uh, for people to live in the urban core, I think it gets, it gets taken up. You need, you need, I believe you need some, some real simple fundamentals like jobs and, and uh, amenities and some of the things that the gentleman were, before me were speaking of. Um, but I'm, I'm a build it and they will come kind of guy when it comes to urban residential. So I think there's a lot of different markets um, that if you create residential housing, I think they'll come, so. Um, I'm wondering if this idea of community, are you able to actually command higher rents by promoting this idea? You know, I look, great question. Um, Possibly. Um, I look at it more as a, as a retention tool. Um, I look at it more as when there's, um, I'm, a big, I'm a big creation over competition, so I don't study uh, competition or inundate myself with that. But I do think if you have value, then you can start to begin to charge incrementally for it. Um, but I don't, I don't know yet. We'll, we'll see. Is it part of that too? When you have no vacancy? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not that you have more, you have more income. So he's, you're in that charging market. Sure. The charging market rent, but you're getting more than the person down the street. Correct. Who isn't dealing with the development as a community that you are, because if that person is not vacant space, that you don't have, your cash flow just comes up. Correct, correct. And we, and we have, so we have zero vacancy in a waiting list, so people think we charge too little. Um, but I, I, I don't. I don't think that's true. I, I, I think we're at market, and I want to be market rate uh, company. So, but I, I believe that's that's true as well. What's your ideal square footage for the people looking for? Uh, ideal. Well, in Grand Rapids, every market we're finding is a little different. The ones we're starting to poke around in are, are different. Um, Grand Rapids, there's a heavy one bedroom demand. So, 70 percent of our units we develop as one bedroom. Um, square footage for one bedroom is typically 600 to 800. Look at Monica and that in some way. Right? Okay. Um, two bedrooms, everything's below 1,000, even our two bedrooms uh, are 950 at the most. Uh, so I believe if you, if you have everything but a formal dining room, it, it feels bigger. It, it really feels bigger than what it actually is when you hear. 700 square feet, you think of your high school bedroom, and that that's not the case when you start seeing it laid out with our open floor plans and, and everything. One more. What's your website address? Uh, 616lofts.com and 616development.com. All right, thank you, Derek.